right now to Carol Owens, and if you'll turn to the first page. For those who live, get the picture. Way back in the Garden of Eden, God shook his angry finger at that serpent, and he said, from now on, the sea, the, the baby that comes out of this lady's body, you're going to have enmity with her, her baby, and you're going to cut, you're going to bruise his heel, and I'm going to crush you, your, but he's going to crush your head. And for years, people looked for some kind of breaking, some kind of deliverance. The priest would spend hours killing one lamb after another. He would kill them from daylight until dark, or vice versa, whatever your Jewish thing it is. And at the end of the day, his garment was, was white, it was all bloodstained. And he goes home tired and weary. And he says to his wife, Honey, I did it one more time, but I'm going to have to do it again. They just aren't changed in one bit. And so for years, every priest got up and shed blood. And then the prophets would come and they'd say, there's going to become a Messiah who's going to deliver the world. And they would crucify Isaiah, the Daniel talked about one being killed. Isaiah, uh, Psalms talked about, the, uh, about the, the one who would be hanging upon a cross. And everybody would turn their head from him. And he talked about the misery. You can see it in Psalm 22. Isaiah talked about a coming redeemer. Ezekiel said the same. And in years, 400 years, nothing happened. All silent. Then a baby was born. Baby in Bethlehem. Why? Yeah, you'd think it'd be a Donald Trump or a or a, a Elizabeth Warren, but no, it was a baby. Just a little old simple baby born. Now after three years and three and a half years and, and building up some kind of following, he's sitting there in a the room. One man has already left. He's going to betray him. He's going to make some money out of this deal. He, the, the rumors all over town. <coughs> that Jesus that's walking around these streets, the high priest and the high monkey mucks are out to kill him. And these men who sat there hoping that they would be part of that great kingdom that was coming, now they were buying and they were hoping for their own positions. And then when he passed out that bread, if you read, read it in Luke, he passed out that bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body. Oh, it changed the whole thing. They heard about his death. He talked about it regularly. But now by breaking that body and bread and eat, having them eat it, he was saying to them, I'm going to be dying. I'm being broken. So there they are. The, the candles are getting black, darker. Food is what is left of all coal. These guys are saying, what's going to happen now? Did Judas go to get more bread? Did he go to get something more for them? What's going to happen to us? And then Jesus says to them, turn to the next shadow, please. The next slide. It doesn't have that verse. It doesn't have those verses. It doesn't have that? No. Nope. All right. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. There's more than enough room in my father's home. If this were my soul, that I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you. And then I realized, my friends, God always had a place for his people. He planned for a place for all his people. They were in the Garden of Eden. Yahweh God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate and keep it 
Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. And then when the world was so corrupt and judgment was coming, God said, no, build an ark. The ark in Genesis chapter 7, God says to Noah, it's time. Go into the ark now. Take your entire household with you because I see that you are the only one in this generation who lives right before me. Genesis chapter 7. And then when the Jews were all in slavery and crying for deliverance from their, their masters, they, God prepared blood on the sides of the doors of the house, the threshold and the, and the, the part over the uh, door. And anybody that was in that place was saved from the death angel. God always has a place for his people. And then, my friends, he says, I am going to prepare a place for you. Now, there's where some of you right now are going to... See, I've been using this scripture for sermons all my life. Well, not all my life. I didn't do it as a kid. But when I had sermons, I had a funeral, I always read the scripture. This scripture is not for the dead. It's for the living. It's for the living. It's for those that have troubled hearts. It's for those that have anxious spirits and troubled hearts. Have you ever been there? Anybody never had a troubled spirit or a troubled heart? Anybody? Anybody like that? I'm the only one? <laughs> You're all waiting out there yet, aren't you? I hope so. My friends, here's the thing. He says, it's a command. Don't be afraid. Don't let your hearts be troubled. That's a command. And when you make a command, whenever God makes a command, he says, it can happen. You don't have to be troubled in your heart. You don't have to be troubled with your spirit. You don't have to. And now, my friends, I, I know some of you are thinking, oh, this is when they, they read this when my, my dad died or my husband passed away. No, 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 I'm not talking about, I'm talking about those who live. I'm talking about those who are living right now. I go to prepare a place. You know what that word place means? I, I did some research on it. And if I'm wrong, please come and tell me after you do some research. <laughs> the place dwelling. I have come to dwell. I have a place for you. The word became flesh and dwelled among us. The Greek words, there's a lot of Greek, one word can mean a hundred things, but the word dwell in John chapter 1, verse, I think verse 14, said he made a tabernacle. God came and tabernacled among us. That was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ tabernacled among them. He was there. The Jews, when they saw the tabernacle, they said, there's God. There's God. Let's go. Get in. Worship God. And Jesus said to Thomas, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In other words, you've seen Jesus. you see God. And now he says, I'm going to make a place, a tabernacle, a dwelling, a place for you to live. When? Right here. Right now. You see, my friends, you and I, when we put our lives in the hands of Jesus Christ, when we surrender our lives to Him, when we, when we give up our own stingy, selfish, self-centered ways, we come into Christ. We are in Christ. Oh, I wish I was in a Pentecostal church. <laughs> I'd have people run on the aisle, and I'd have people shouting and singing, and there'd be tambourines and going. But no, it looks like, oh, I don't know what to say that. Be nice. Hey, anybody wait out there? Hey. <laughs> no, we're, I lost my shade of thought. Now you're in trouble. Now you're really in trouble. Okay, here's my friend. Here's what it means. 
he made a place for us right here, right now. When Jesus Christ, his first sermon, he said, the kingdom of God is here. Not entirely. Not entirely. It's coming. The whole thing is going to come eventually. Someday the whole kingdom of God, Jesus is going to come back as a bride adorned for his wedding. You ever seen a wedding? Never. Oh my God. I was at a wedding last night. Woo! <laughs> now I know why I do weddings. Whoa, I, I've never seen an ugly bride. Did you? No, I didn't. <laughs> Even the photographers was good. I, I had to say to them, you're going to make me distracted from what I'm doing. Oh, my goodness sake. A bride, here comes God. But in the meantime, <laughs> excuse me, if somebody tried to get me a glass of water, I'd appreciate it. Oh, that's be all right. I'll just talk to the one. All right, in the meantime, we're in what my alcoholic friends, I used to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. No, not because I, no, I didn't have that problem. I thought I had other problems, but it wasn't that. And my friends, they talked about the meantime. And you and I, we are now, we are in Christ. Jesus Christ hung on that cross, and according to Hebrews, he took his blood, and he went into the Holy of Holies, and he poured that blood out and sprinkled it on all the furniture and everything in that Holy of Holies. The, the robe, the, the, oh, the curtain that hung between the separated was torn apart, and now the writer of Hebrews says, come boldly. Come bold into the throne of grace. And so now, the place that Jesus prepared for you, my friends, is the kingdom of God. It's Christ himself. Christ is in you. I know we don't... Oh, thanks for that. Amen. That must have been a Baptist that said that. Thank you. Ah, oh, my friend, here we go. You're hanging in there, are you? But this is the last time I heard a priest. Good thing you came to hear me. Okay. Now, well, well, thank you, Randy. Give Randy a big hand, will you? Oh, my God. He's got job, but he's got a good helper around here. We're in the meantime. I just talked to somebody, and they said, Go, oh, old age isn't what it's cracked up to be. Uh, he's not telling me anything. Uh, the, one of the men that I, uh, I finally had to marry, he said the best thing about the only good thing about the golden age was the now you ask me later what the rest of the story was. <laughs> My friends, if something doesn't age after you're 21, <laughs> you're either dead <laughs> or your bones aren't working right. <laughs> Once you reach 22, you'll have a bone. I don't know if Brad is going to disagree with me here. You're going to, this guy was a swimmer. This guy, but anyway, once you turn 21, you can plan on a ache for the rest of your life. Amen. I had a man in my church one time. He didn't like me very well. He made it very clear most of the time. <laughs> he had a back problem, and he went to, he had a surgery on his back, and I went to visit him in the hospital, and he said, Fred, he called me Fred. <laughs> and he probably called me other things. Other times. <laughs> and he said, I had a spur in my bowl at back, and that's what gave me the trouble. And I said, oh, I was almost ready to give his name. Huh? I said, I'm glad it was a spur and a spur in your back that gave you pain in your behind. I said rear to him. I'm glad it was a pain from a spur that gave him pain in the rear instead of me. <laughs> My friends, you and I right now are in Christ. What does that look like? I'm going to decide to you, my friends, that it's the safest place you and I can be. That's right. Isaiah, excuse me, Psalm, Psalm 91, and I don't know what all that pestilence means. We live within the shadow of the Almighty. 
sheltered by God who alone is above all gods. This I declare, that he alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I trust in him. For he rescues you from every trap and protects you from the fatal plague. He will shelter, shield you with his waves. They will shelter you with his faithful promises on your armor. Now you don't need to be afraid of the dark anymore, nor fear the dangers of the day, nor dread the plagues of darkness, nor disasters in the morning. I might add to that, well, I might say, you know what some of the most pestilence and dark disasters are? It's when we compare each other with each other. When people begin to compare me with Robert Redford. <laughs> That's a disaster. I would go to a church, I'd be moved to a church, and I'd compare to the other guy. Well, the other guy, they always, they always talk better about the other guy than they talk about me. Yeah, they say, yeah. They, they, oh, we, yeah, we like you, Pastor. Oh, we sure love so and so. That was a, sometimes a disaster. They'd come in and they'd say, oh, I just heard a good sermon from Rex Humbard. Was it Rex Humbard? Yeah, I called him other things, but uh, <laughs> and then we just heard a good sermon from Rex Humbard. Now we're going to come hear you. But anyway, here's the thing, my friends. Those are desolate. Those are probably pestilences. And then Isaiah 43. <coughs> but now the Lord who created you, O Israel, don't be afraid. I have ransomed you. I have called you by my name. You are mine. Can it get any better than that? Yeah. Can it be any better? You know, my friends, when you're in Christ, every sin you've ever committed, or every sin you're going to commit, has all been forgiven. Not only that, he takes away the power of sin. He takes away that desire to want to sin, to want to kick a wall, or, or throw a wrench, or, or scuss out somebody. He gives you that power to say no to that kind of stuff. That's what Christ does. He gives us an assurance of where it is. Oh, my friends, I, I awakened one night in the middle of the night and a person's name came to my mind. And I never thought of that. I gotta pray. I gotta pray. And I began to pray for that person. And later I heard the rest of the story. Someone was in deep trouble deep, deep trouble, and it was that very time God called me to pray. I talked to Homer, Homer Jackson the other day at Spring Arbor. He flew a B-29 in World War II. He said, we ran into all kinds of kamikaze attacks and shrapnel. You read the stories, they're, they're frightening. These guys were soldiers in the air, and many of them never returned. And he said, the kamikazes were out, and he said, my wingman got hit by a kamikaze, and he was out in a flash. He said, I looked up, and here's a plane diving down at me. They're at 5,000 feet. And he said, I saw a plane diving at me, the kamikaze. He said, it was so close. I thought for sure. I, I could see his face. I could see that, that Japanese pilot's face. And I said, weren't you afraid? He said, Fred, no, he wasn't really afraid. He said, one thing he knew he was doing his work. He was doing what he sat there to do. And he was otherwise. He said, divine intervention. That's what it is in the presence of God when you are in Christ. And not everybody survived the war and they were in Christ. I can't explain all that. You get to heaven, you'll find out. My friends, Christ has a way of keeping us. There was a time when I didn't want to go to, I didn't want to preach. I just dragged my tail in. Oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. I saw my Donald Trump. I just dragged myself. I said, God, I don't want to preach. I don't want to do this today. I don't want to. Where did I get the strength to get up there and preach? Where did I get it? It's God. The Holy Spirit. That's one of the resources we have, my friends. That's how we are equipped so we can 
we can live without a troubled heart and a troubled mind. One is, you are in Christ. I'm working on something in my shop. I can't find the tool or it's broken or something's wrong with it. And I'm thinking, I'm in Christ. I'm in Christ. My wife says to me, uh, you wrote a check for such and such. Uh, do you know what that was for? How much it was? Uh, my friend, even when I forget, I'm in Christ. And he loves me unconditionally. And so are you. So are you. Remind yourself. And that's one of the equipping powers that we have. You are in Christ. And you are protected by God Almighty himself. And then there is another one. He said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. You'll have to find all this in John chapter 14. He said, I will not leave you as orphans. I'll come to you. Oh, I love the King James. There are two ladies going to help me with this. Come forward, would you please? I want to give you another comforter, he says. I don't, uh, that's, the, that's the translation I like. Others say other words, but don't worry about that. We're going to, okay. Now, did I give you some, a dollar? Okay. Uh, tell me your name again. Allie? Allie? Or Ellie? Allie. Allie. Say hi to Allie for me, will you? Hi. She'll teach your kids if you want to know Spanish, okay? <laughs> All right, I got a dollar in my hand. What does this dollar buy me? Uh, What's that? Uh, oh, come on, you, you, you sound like a Democrat. Okay. <laughs> well, what is it? What is it? Uh, Nothing is right. Yeah, I remember I could buy three gallons of gas for this. Yeah, exactly. I, I can't buy much, can I? Oh, I'm a senior citizen. I can buy a cup of coffee. Yeah, yeah pop machine in the hallway. <laughs> and what else? Something. No, can I buy a lipstick for my wife? No. Uh, what is the can I buy a uh, okay, anyway, now, this is what that dollar will do, okay? Now, what have you got in your hand? What do you, and what's your name again? Jenna? All right, you have that back. Now, Jenna's got a dollar. What will I do? What's that? No more than the first one. No more than the first one. Ah! Now, you ready for a lesson? <coughs> I'm afraid. This. Okay. Everybody, get your thinking. Every get your notes out. Because I, I want you to know that Pastor Fred said because this is gospel truth. Comforter comes from the Greek word. Parakletos. Paraclete. Thank you, ladies. <laughs> Give me a And it means one called alongside to help. When you are teaching somebody to ride a bike, you study them so they can ride their bike. When you are teaching somebody how to bake a cake, you are standing beside them, helping them make that cake. Is that right? That's right. When you were teaching your daughter how to drive a car, you prayed forever. <laughs> you know, you, it helped to explain, stay beside them. My friend, that's what the Holy Spirit does. Now Jesus said, I'm going to give you another. And she had one, and so did Al. What it means is this. The very ministry that Jesus did on earth, Jesus was one called alongside to help. He healed the sick. He healed the, he gave sight to the blind. He did a number, a number of ministries and works and miracles. And he said great things. He called people to love him. And then, he said, I'm going to give you another one. And the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, is now in this world. 
not limited by time or space or anything else, he's come alongside to help. I don't like that poem, uh, the footprints in the sand, because my friends, I've got a savior, I've got a comforter who walks beside me whether I've got good sand or bad sand. He walks beside me all the time. I can see it on him. I can see some of you know what I'm talking about. You're coming through that. You're finding that counselor that's helping you. You find that the Spirit of Christ is helping you. Here, I can see you guys. Your life is changing, all of us. Life is changing. I see it. I see some of you bury your loved ones and some of you with your illnesses and problems. But my friends, we are in Christ. And we have a comforter. We have someone called alongside to help us. And he will help us, I guarantee you. I can talk for you forever about that. And then the other is, we're quick with answered prayers. I'll be quick here. Today. What time is it? i got to be done before noon. Oh, you, got, you got time. <laughs> okay, now here we go. We're equipped by answered prayers. You abide in me, and my words abide in you. Ask whatever you will. Now, I want you to stay awake. Someone's going to think, oh, I can go out and pray for a Cadillac. You get it. Maybe, if that's God's will. No. I prayed for a buck and didn't get one. Not yet, anyway. I got two more days. <laughs> but, my friends, here's the thing. Whatever will help you in that journey to heaven, whatever will in, in, equip you on your way to heaven, whatever will equip you to be a witness for Christ in this world, you pray, and God will send the resources to help you. I can't think of this man's name. I can't. I can't. You probably know it. I think it was. Uh, I think. It was Andy Butterfield who told me about the man. But here's the case. Here's what he did. He raised an orphanage in London with bread. But he did it only by prayer. He did not go out demonstrating and asking the begging for money. He did it by praying. And as he prayed, the bread came in. And one day, his supervisor, his steward, or whoever is in charge of the money said, uh, Mr. Whoever, whatever his name is, said, Mr. Whoever, we don't have any bread today, and it's time to feed the children within another hour. What are we going to do? The man said, have faith in God. Pray. And just when the time for the bread to be delivered, the kids were to sit down to eat. Here came a bread truck. Bread. You know what that missionary did, that orphanage director? He fired the guy. Yeah, he fired him. He said, you don't have enough faith to work here. Bye. <laughs> That's what Christ will do. You call on him. He'll supply your needs. But Beverly tells of a, of a lady who was down to just very little fuel oil in her tank. Little in the winter. This lady said, I kept paying the tithe, kept paying the tithe, giving my tithe. Not to bribe God, but to give him a tithe. And he said, that little bit of fuel oil kept us all in the middle. <coughs> God will help us, my friends. God will help us. I, I don't want to say a whole lot. I, I don't want you to think I'm talking about myself. Yeah, I, but there's a lady. I was in Bay City, and they called me uh, from uh, Memphis. They said, Pastor Fred, there's a person. He was, she didn't, they didn't go to, they, when I left the uh, Memphis church, they left, uh, little rascals. But anyway, they called me and said, Pastor Fred, our sister Carol, she's in a coma. She's been in a coma, terrible auto accident. She had not been out of that coma for days. She said, would, would you go see her? Oh, yeah, sure. I so I went down to, to uh, Flint. I went to, down to, uh, to whatever it was, Sparrow or whatever the hospital was. I tried to get. I don't like Flint at all. And I drove down to basically Flint, walked in the hospital room, and I said, Carol. And she woke up. Oh, my. 
She woke up. And she sat up. <coughs> and she came out of the pool. Now, I've had times I've talked and put people to sleep. <laughs> but my friend, she came out of that pool. Is that something? I talked to a bishop one time, and I said, have you ever seen demon possession? Yeah, I said, uh, he, he downplayed it. He didn't brag about it. He downplayed it. Yeah, I said, there was in a village I was in. His bishop, uh, what's the one that had the kids in it? Uh, he didn't like it very well. <laughs> he said, I didn't either, but anyway, there was a bishop. <laughs> anyway, I asked him, I said, what is it? Did you ever have demon possession? Yes, he said, I did. So they called me to go home, and there was a lady, a girl, so it was a teenage girl, and she was, they said, she just almost comatose. He said, well, they laid their hands on her and prayed with her, and they tell her that she got better. She got better. See, my friends, the Holy Spirit works in this world, and as we pray, as we pray, and you know, I've, I've gotten there, I pray like this, Lord, help people to see Christ in this situation. Help them to be surrendered to you and to your will. I am being convinced more and more that there are some things that I thought were so valuable and so important, I would the scat to what I've seen in other people. I've seen people try out. I think arthritis is something. Bah! I see people with greater difficulty and greater problems in arthritis or heart trouble. But I also know this. They are triumphing. God is working with them. And you're sitting here today. You've had some rough spots in your life, and you're going through rough times right now. But I'm here to tell you, you're in Christ, and God is working and helping you through these tough spots in your life. I believe that, and I believe it's true. Then, my friends, he equips us with love. John chapter 15, verses 12 through 14. This is my commandment, only one commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, washed everybody's feet. Even the man who betrayed him. And he said, no greater love is this than you lay down your life for your friend. And my friends, what do we do with somebody who shoots up? We need to give it the, we the whole show at least a couple of days. Not him. He washed feet. And my friends, the biggest, why does he tell us the Lord? That's the biggest, most powerful instrument that Satan can't handle is the love of Christ working in our lives. That's the first thing that comes to you once you get saved and get right with God. That's the first thing that comes to you. Love. Love. And with love, you can advance, you can take it on the wall, you can advance over the troops, you can do mighty, mighty things because of love. Everybody wants to be loved. Everybody needs love. I'm not talking, you know what kind of love I'm talking about. You all know what I'm talking about. So I'm not going to go on with that. My friends, today, I'm hoping this sermon is not just another message to entertain you and make you feel good. I'm hoping that whatever situation you're in, I'm hoping and I'm praying that you'll take it with a surrendered heart Christ. My prayer this morning was that we've come with surrendered hearts and open hands. Oh, I know there's things that break their heart, there's things that scare me and worry me. But my friends, I would have come to the cross. I said to Ed Burkett before he went into the Marines, I said, Ed, one piece of advice. He gave all kinds of advice. I said, one piece of advice. Take everything to the cross. 
choose the colors, he weaves faithfully. Sometimes he weaves dark cords, and I, and careless mind, forget he sees the upper, and I the underside. And when the room is silent, and the sun sees the bride, oh, my heart breaks you guys. God, Will I roll the canvas and reveal the reason why the dark clouds were as necessary in the work with your skillful hands as the cords of gold and silver and the pattern he had planned. He knows, he cares, he understands. It's true, we cannot deny. God did the best of those. Live and breathe and show us what we have. And God, we sometimes we are not at the surrender, but I pray for the grace to have open hands and open hearts and be surrendered to your will that they pay us. I pray that when I say to myself, I pray, Lord, that these dear people, as they go through whatever they're going through, they're good. Open hands so that we can go. In Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.